Infectious diseases. Research. Medicine. Health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. Now, Nipah virus is one of the deadliest viruses, which can kill up to 90% of those infected. In fact, the World Health Organization has placed Nipah on its 10 most wanted list of emergent viruses. Well, joining me today to talk more about Nipah and her research is Emily Gurley, PhD. Dr. Gurley is an associate scientist with the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Gurley, welcome to the show, ma'am. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. Okay, excellent. Well, I mean, I work with laboratory people here in the United States, and there's a lot of people, even in the laboratory field, that are not familiar with Nipah virus. So let's start out with the basics. What is Nipah virus, and geographically, where is it found? Sure. So Nipah is a part of the paramyxovirus family. Um, there are some other viruses you've probably heard of that are a part of the same family, including measles. Um, and Nipah is in the Hanipa virus genus. It has um, it shares that genus with other emerging viruses, called, including Hindra virus. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, the Hanipa viruses, are viruses that um, are have evolved with bats. So primarily they're bat viruses, but sometimes they infect other species as well. So the vi uh, Nipah virus um, is carried by Tropus fruit bats, not all species, but many, including Tropus medius, Tropus uh, hypomelanus, and those fruit bats live throughout Asia. So wherever those fruit bats live, you're going to find Nipah virus in those bats. That would be from, uh, you know, through the South Asian subcontinent all the way over into East Asia, into the Philippines, uh, down into Indonesia, and uh, perhaps also in Madagascar, which is off of the East Coast of Africa. There are Tropus bats there, too, and we're looking to identify if they have Nipah or Nipah-like viruses. Oh, wow. Um can you give the audience a little bit of history about NEPA, uh, maybe a short timeline? Sure. So NEPA was first identified uh, in an outbreak that happened in Malaysia and Singapore in 1998-1999. At first, they thought that um, the outbreak, it was an outbreak of encephalitis, it was in humans, and they thought that Perhaps it was caused by another virus called Japanese encephalitis, which frequently causes encephalitis in that part of the world. But um, as the outbreak went on, they realized that it probably wasn't Japanese encephalitis. And uh, a microbiologist who was there uh, working on the ground and, and, and working with some of the samples from patients isolated a new virus from one of the patient specimens. And they called it Nipah. It was named after the village where that patient came from. Uh, unfortunately, we still have that uh, convention today where we name viruses from the first place where we identify it. Um, so that's how Nipah got its name. Um, and then um, once we identified the virus, we were able to make, or we, the, the global health community, made laboratory tests so that we could look for human infections uh, for this virus and look for infections in bats as well. And so once we had those diagnostic tests by you know, 1999, 2000, we started finding Nipah in more places. So in 2001, there were two outbreaks of encephalitis identified in uh, South Asia, one in India and uh, one in Bangladesh. And uh, we had a new test, right, for NEPA, and when patient specimens were tested, um, they identified that those patients, in fact, had NEPA. Um, and in Bangladesh, where I've done most of my work, uh, 
We've identified uh, people with Nipah infections almost every year since 2001, since we had that diagnostic test. So probably people have been infected with Nipah for a long time, but you know, unless we have a test, unless we have a, a way to detect them, um, then we don't see them. We've continued to see outbreaks of Nipah um, in, in new areas. I say new is probably in quotes. Um, again, wherever the bats are, the virus is, but we're probably getting better at picking up human infections. Um, there was a, an outbreak in southwest India in 2018 in, in Kerala. Um, that was a, a newer area where, where, where human infections had not been previously identified. There was also an outbreak in the Philippines in 2015, further expanding the area where we know humans can be infected. Um, so that's a short timeline. No, that's fantastic. Um, now, it's a zoonotic disease. Um, so, Dr. Gurley, how do people contract this virus? All right. So, so a zoonotic disease means that it's, it's transmitted from animals to people. Um, and Nipah can be transmitted in a number of different ways. So, um, in some cases, bats directly um, transmit the virus to people, and this is through shared food. This is what happens in Bangladesh, where uh, humans and bats both um, ha you know, have shared food sources, uh, namely date palm sap. So date palm trees uh, produce uh, sugary sweet sap, particularly in the winter. Humans uh, tap the trees to collect the sap, uh, and they drink it fresh. It's a delicacy. And the bats like it too. So um, almost all uh, human cases in Bangladesh uh, have been infected through uh, consumption of date palm sap um, through the shared food source with bats. Um, in other uh, parts of the world, we're not quite as sure how humans are first infected from bats. Um, but we do know that sometimes people are infected through uh, other animals. So bats somehow infect livestock, maybe horses, as in the case of the Philippines, um, or pigs, as in the case of the outbreak in Malaysia and Singapore, where we first identified Nipah. Um, the pigs uh, were infected from the bats, and then the pigs infected people. Likewise, in, in the Philippines, horses became infected and horses infected people. Um, so those are called intermediate hosts. So that, that can happen. In Bangladesh, we haven't seen much of that, um, but, but that's another way that Nipah can be transmitted to people. Now, is there any human-to-human -human transmission? And it is, if so, if not, um, is there much risk at all of this ever becoming like a global epidemic issue? Well, you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that WHO has NEPA on its most wanted list, if yep. you will. Um, and the reason it's a global concern is because of this person-to-person -person transmission potential. So since the first outbreaks were identified uh, in, in South Asia in 2001, we've consistently seen person-to-person -person transmission of NEPA. So once someone becomes infected from, from a bat, they then infect, go on to infect other people. Um, we are new to this game uh, as, a, as a public health community in trying to understand which viruses are going to emerge to become pandemics or to become a, a global threat. Um, and, you know, Many of the viruses that have caused that have caused pandemics or that cause large regional outbreaks, including the novel coronavirus uh, that we're all uh, thinking about right now, um, emerge from animals. But uh, we're just not very good at predicting which ones are going to cause uh, problems. Um, for example, you know, HIV is another classic case where this virus was first. Um, uh, you know, first infected people, a certain number of people, we don't know how many, but then, you know, one or two times that virus really took off and, and gained a new niche in people and became a human-adapted virus. So how many times 
does a human have to be infected with a, with a bat virus or a virus from another species before that virus becomes a human virus and, and is really able to um, carry out its life in people without, you know, without the need for other species? We, and the answer, I mean, we just don't know. Right. We don't know how often it has to spill over. So um, what we try to do is focus on pathogens that have at least demonstrated the capacity to transmit between people. Um, and again, our laboratory techniques are better than ever, and so we pick up on things now that we probably wouldn't have in the past. But you know, the question remains, which of them should we really be worried about, and, and we just don't know. Um, so could NEPA, um, could NEPA cause a pandemic? Could it? The answer is, yeah, it could, um, but it would have to be more transmissible than it currently is. Right. So with the current epidemiology and what we currently see, it's unlikely to cause a large regional outbreak or a pandemic, but we don't know um, if, you know, it could be that there are more highly transmissible strains out there that just haven't spilled over yet, um, or if, you know, if, if it were given the right context, um, maybe the virus could become more transmissible. Yep. So the short answer is we don't know, but it's enough of a concern that this is this is why it's getting it gets global attention. Of course, um, <clears throat> just for the audience who may, who may have never seen this type of fruit bat, can you give a verbal picture of what we're dealing with? They're very cute. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're often called flying foxes. Um, so that should give uh, something of a picture. They have uh, they have a, a short snout like like a fox. Um, they have big brown eyes. They're very furry, and they have ears that that would look like a fox's ears. Um, the different uh, teropus species can have gray or brown heads or black black fur. Um, and they're large, so these are fruit bats. They eat fruit. Um, they don't hunt people. They don't bite people. They're actually very important for the ecology and for pollinating fruit trees that we rely on. Um, so they're, they're our friends. Um, and these fruit bats are big, so the wingspans can be up to four feet uh, at least for, for grown adults. Um, they're very social animals. They live in roosts all together in trees. So they don't live in caves. They, they, they roost together in trees. Um, they give birth to live young, and the mothers will carry the pups around, flying around with them until the pups are ready to fly on their own. Um, and they, um, yeah, cute, like, like, yep. like flying foxes. Think of a little flying fox. Yeah, I, I've, I've posted stories about NEPA in the past using a, pretty much a standard uh, a fruit bat picture, and that's frequently a comment I get. Oh, how cute! <laughs> so you you were right on target when you first said that, um, Dr. Gurley. Now let's talk about the pathology, and um, as I said in the intro, the the uh, morbidity rate is is pretty more. Excuse me, mortality rate is pretty high. Uh, what kind of pathology do we see typically with NEPA? So the first you know, signs and symptoms are similar to any other infection. So uh, people would get a fever. Um, and this virus is very, um, it's very good at infecting all, all of our organs. So the, the receptor for the virus um, is throughout our um, throughout the lining of our vascular system, our respiratory system. So, so when we're infected with this virus, it can replicate in our lungs, in the brain. In particular, it causes problems in the brain, um, but really throughout the vasculature um, and throughout our organs. So patients with NEPA, again, at the first day or two, they'll, they'll have a fever, but it can quickly progress to become severe respiratory disease or severe neurologic disease, where patients have seizures, altered mental status, and coma. That kind of leads me to the next question. You, t you talk about different types of pathology, respiratory versus neurological. You also talked about 
different uh, intermediate hosts at, like pigs in Malaysia and uh, others in other countries. Now, some of the largest outbreaks, of course, was the initial Malaysia one and then the various Bangladesh ones. What were the significant differences between the out these types of outbreaks in those two two countries? Yeah, well, the outbreak in Malaysia, as you mentioned, was the largest outbreak to date. And our best guess of what happened there is that fruit bats uh, were feeding on, you know, fruits that were being fruit trees that were being um, that were being grown on pig farms. So the commercial pig industry, pork production industry in Malaysia was really taking off. And so they had a lot of uh, very intensive farming in areas where um, they had not been farming before. So this provided a new um, interface for bats to come into contact with uh, pigs who were susceptible to the virus. And then there were so many new piglets coming in to the farms that the there was an outbreak. The outbreak was able to be sustained within the pig population on some of these farms. And so um, people who came into contact with those pigs got sick. And when pigs became sick, their case fatality wasn't that high. But when some pigs became sick or were dying, they were sold to other farms. And then so that helped to spread the outbreak in pigs um, throughout the Malaysian Peninsula um, and infect more people. So that outbreak was big because it, it went on for a long time before we realized what it was. Um, again, because it was a new virus, we didn't have any tools to, to look for it. Um, so in that outbreak, people were infected primarily from pigs. There was some, you know, most people had encephalitis, but there were some people who also presented with respiratory disease. That's similar to what we've seen in Bangladesh. We have a mix of atypical pneumonia and, uh, and neurologic disease. Um, but in contrast to Malaysia, our, the, the epidemiology in Bangladesh is not you know, one big outbreak. We have very small outbreaks every year. Some cases are even isolated cases, just one case, one person infected from a bat. Um, as I mentioned before, humans in Bangladesh are infected through date pump sap consumption, but also through person-to-person -person transmission. In Malaysia, there's some evidence that there was person-to-person -person transmission, but it wasn't a major feature recognized in that outbreak. Um, in Bangladesh, it's very common. So approximately 30% of all people in Bangladesh who had Nipah virus were infected by another patient. Um, but most patients don't infect someone else. So only 10% of all Nipah patients will ever infect someone else um, in Bangladesh. We see differences in the case fatality rate between those two outbreaks or two countries as well. So in Malaysia overall, about 40% of patients with Nipah died. In Bangladesh, it's closer to about 75%. But there's a big difference um, and the proportion of people who die based on how you get infected. So if you are infected from, through date palm sap consumption in Bangladesh, the case fatality is over 90%. If you're infected uh, through contact with another patient, um, the case fatality is about 50%, which is closer to what it was in Malaysia. And we think that's probably because uh, the dose of virus you receive through those different transmission routes uh, is different. And probably, our, our best guess is that people who are uh, exposed to the virus through date pump sap are just getting a much higher dose than people who are being infected through you know, contact with respiratory secretions of patients, for example. Um, and the same may be true with Malaysia. Perhaps uh, in the Malaysian outbreak, patients were just exposed to a lower dose of virus through the contact with pigs. Um, than they may have been if they were infected directly from bats. Um, it, we can't discount the, the role of, of supportive care um, and, and, and health care and, and survival of NEPA patients. So as I mentioned, many uh, patients will have severe respiratory disease. Um, also, when the, when the virus attacks the brain, 
Um, it can create, uh, you know, it can attack the part of the brain that controls breathing. So many patients, for one reason or another, may need ventilator support, uh, particularly during that critical uh, phase of their infection when their immune system is working to fight off the virus. They, they may need help breathing. Um, in Bangladesh, patients really don't have access to that kind of care, uh, whereas in Malaysia they did. So improvements in that kind of supportive care could also uh, be responsible for some of the differences that we've seen in case fatality. All right. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and give you a chance to discuss. You said you do a lot of work in Bangladesh. Uh, discuss your time in Bangladesh, your research, and the preempt project. So uh, Bangladesh has been my academic home for many years. I lived there uh, for about 13 years. and. Um, since 2003, have worked for or closely with an organization called the ICDDRB, which stands for the International Center for Diarrheal Diseases Research Bangladesh. They go by ICDDRB because they moved beyond diarrheal diseases uh, many decades ago, although there's still a cholera hospital there on site. Um, and I, my time there, um, I worked on outbreak investigations and surveillance systems. We worked very closely with the government of Bangladesh to help build capacity for these kinds of emerging pandemic threats um, and also generate data for uh, vaccine preventable diseases to help inform public health programs and to improve the health of people in Bangladesh. Um, I, I worked uh, there until uh, 2016 when I, I was the director of the Emerging Infections program there, and that's when I moved to Johns Hopkins. Um, my, my work on NEPA also spans um, much of my career, so one of the very first outbreak investigations I ever worked on was a NEPA outbreak in 2004. Um, and it was one of the first outbreaks, in fact, where we realized that NEPA could be transmitted between people from person to person. Mm -hmm. The first outbreaks in Malaysia, as I mentioned, didn't really report person to person transmission. And although, in retrospect, we now know that person to person transmission had, been, had occurred, at the time, this wasn't well known. The data weren't publicly available. Um, and so one of the outbreaks we responded to in 2004, when we arrived and uh, started to collect information from patients, we realized very quickly um, that many of the patients we were seeing had all had contact with someone else with the same uh, symptoms who had died about a, a week, 10 days before. Um, and so we drew what's called an epidemiologic curve that helps us see onset dates of patients, and that can give us clues about how transmission is occurring. And we saw that that, that outbreak was probably being transmitted person to person. Um, and it was, a very, it was a very scary realization. At, at the time, we didn't have laboratory testing in country, so we, couldn't, we thought it could be NEPA, but it was showing us something new, right? It was showing us that it was transmitted between people, which we had never, you know, which wasn't really a part of what we knew about NEPA at the time. And so we wondered if it was actually something else. This was right after the SARS outbreak. Um, and that scares, so we wondered if it could be SARS. Um, so that really had a, a strong and made a, made a big impression on me um, as a junior epidemiologist on the team, thinking about, okay, Number one, how do we, how can we do a better job at finding outbreaks sooner? Um, how can we build local capacity? How can we get smarter about finding emerging threats regardless of the cause? Um, and two, how, you know, how can we um, identify these, uh, these outbreaks once they start, um, once they start infecting more people, infecting healthcare workers? Um, you know, what kind of surveillance do we have in place? How would we know if these are happening? What do we do about it when we find it in particular? Um, so I spent a lot of time thinking about uh, prevention strategies, thinking about how we can get smarter for about outbreak detection and surveillance for emerging pandemic threats. Um, and as you may know, as your, as your listeners may know, public health is about 
primary prevention. So we don't want, of course, we want to know how can we treat patients, how can we prevent mortality uh, when people get sick, but really we're about trying to figure out how to prevent that disease in the first place. And for diseases like NEPA, um, if we think about primary prevention, if we want to prevent those infections in people in the first place, we have to go back to the animal reservoirs. And so my, my work uses a One Health approach. I don't know if your listeners will have heard of One Health before, but One Health is this idea that we can't look at human health in isolation. We have to understand it within the context of the health of the environment and with other species because our, our well-being is inextricably linked to the well-being of the environment and other species. Um, NEPA is a classic example of how this works. Um, people can intuitively understand, right, if, if the air is polluted and the water is polluted, people are also going to be unhealthy. Um, so, so I think people have an intuitive understanding of how that works. Um, but that approach and that, that framework is really the most useful for thinking about uh, these kinds of emerging infections, like NEPA, like the, the novel coronavirus uh, out of China, like Ebola. Um, we have to get back to the reservoir hosts, and we need to understand why are they shedding these viruses? What does transmission look like um, within the reservoir hosts? And how are we, this is usually the case, how are we changing the environment uh, to put ourselves at risk for these, um, for these zoonotic infections? So the preempt project that I'm working on now, um, it's a four-country study. Uh, ba Bangladesh is one. We're also studying these viruses in Ghana, Madagascar, and Australia, where we have related viruses, Nipah viruses in all those countries. Um, and we're trying to understand when and where bats shed these viruses and why. So there's been some important work in Australia on a, a virus called Hindra, which is a, like a sister virus to Nipah. Right. It's, a, again, a bat virus. It infects, to, infects horses, and then horses can infect humans. Um, and they've shown that over time, as the bats have... Uh, fewer places to feed due to destruction of habitat, they move closer into cities and they are more likely to feed um, in horse paddocks. They're more likely to be stressed because they don't have enough food um, because of, of habitat destruction. And so that's when they're more likely to shed these viruses. So um, in this day and age where humans have had such a substantial impact on the environment around us, what we see is that we're stressing other species, like these fruit bats, and because they're stressed, they're more likely to be shedding these viruses. Um, that's, our, that's our hypothesis, and we're working to, to flesh that out a bit more, and importantly, understand what we could do to reverse that, uh, the environmental degradation and the habitat loss for those species to reduce the risk to ourselves. Um, that's, so that's the overall goal of the preempt project, primary prevention for these kinds of emerging uh, bat viruses. Um, and, you know, these, these viruses likely carry, you know, they carry coronaviruses, they carry filoviruses, which is the, the Ebola viruses. So unlocking and understanding um, bats, uh, habitat, ecology, and, and how humans interface with that and how we can interface with that in a healthier way for everyone, I think is really crucial um, for, for preventing future pandemics. And that's really where you see your uh, research going in Nipah virus in this new decade? I, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Um, and, and I think, again, we can't, we want to prevent those, those prime, those spillover events. So one, just one transmission event from a bat to a human is enough to cause a big outbreak. Sure. Um, so we want to be preventing those. But at the same time, we also have to be 
uh, prepared for those spillovers to happen, and we have to have a toolbox, if you will, of interventions and strategies that we can use when it does spill over. Um, and so uh, I'm also working now on uh, a couple of uh, projects to develop NEPA vaccines for humans. Um, there's a, a group called the Center for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation, or CEPI, mm -hmm. um, and they, you know, they're taking lessons from the West African Ebola outbreak, where um, at the time of the outbreak, there were a number of vaccine candidates that had been shown um, effective in animal models, but had never been trialed in humans, and that's because to develop vaccines, you have to invest a lot of money. Um, and companies usually don't develop vaccines unless they can see a way to do testing in humans to show that the vaccine prevents disease. For many of these emerging infections, it's hard to predict when and where we're going to see a big outbreak of, of those diseases, like Ebola or Nipah. Um, I mean, if we could predict, we, we might do other, you know, we might do more to prevent them. We're just not very good at predicting it now. There were, um, and so then you also can't design a study to test a vaccine. Um, so the vaccines were just sitting on the shelf because we, uh, and that paradigm we had about how to develop vaccines, uh, there was really no way forward. So what CEPI is doing is funding initiatives to take the vaccines um, under development for these kinds of emerging pathogens. Um, and test them in people just to at least show that they're safe and they're immunogenic, which means that if you, if you get that vaccine, your body has an immune response that we think would be protective so that um, we'd have some vaccines also in our toolkit. If there, are, if there were to be a larger outbreak, um, we would have something that we could, we could try um, and we wouldn't be so behind the ball like we were with Ebola. Um, so, so we're working on those as well. Um, and, you know, as always, I think um, there's always room for improvement and, and getting better at how we detect outbreaks, um, how we incentivize and encourage countries to report outbreaks in a timely way. Um, you know, if, if we, if, again, if we're focused on prevention, then timing is key. We, we need to know about um, we need to know about spillover events before they become big outbreaks. And so I, I think there's certainly a, a role to continue in, improving our, our methods there. Well, very interesting. I'm very happy that I contacted you. <laughs> I actually learned a few things myself, and I appreciate that. And I want to thank you, Dr. Emily Gurley, for sharing your time and your expertise with us today. I appreciate it. My, my pleasure. And, and hopefully... NEPA will remain a bit obscure <laughs> yeah. to everyone if we do our job well. There you go. Thanks a lot.